Welcome to the Heal Your Hunger Show, where we get to the heart of why you overeat and how to stop. If you struggle with food and weight like I did, welcome home. Welcome, everybody, to the Heal Your Hunger Show. It's a great day to be alive, and I am so happy to be here with you. Thanks so much for tuning in. I appreciate that. I have a topic today that is so very close to the heart and experience of emotional eaters, including myself. And I hope this is super helpful for you, especially because it's summertime and we're out and about more these days and eating with friends and having, you know, fun picnics and gatherings and barbecues and all that that goes along with summer. Uh, But it creates complications as emotional eaters at times uh, with a change in our eating habits and plans and all that. So can't wait to dig into that with you. Um, If you're here at the show for the first time, welcome. Really glad you're here. This is where we get uh, down under. We go down under uh, the symptom of food and weight into what's really going on, what's really moving us to uh, eat to obsess about food and how do we overcome that? So, you know, food, food is a symptom. Overweight is a symptom of overeating. Overeating is a symptom of what's eating me. So if you feel like you've got the symptom of overweight or overeating or both, um, you're in the right place because this is where we really deal with the real issues because just chasing our tail with diets and food plans and exercise programs isn't going to be enough. And you might've figured that out by now. (laughs) So I'm really glad you're here. Uh, Please, uh, you know, share the show with friends. Please let them know there's a new tack you can take besides the diet route. This is really a non-diet approach to weight loss. Weight loss from the inside out is what I call it. So happy that you're here and hope you'll come back. So on with the show. Super, super, super excited to be here with you. I have a topic today I think you relate to if you are an emotional eater. If you're not an emotional eater, well, you should take the quiz and find out. So you can go to healyourhunger.com and take my free quiz, which will actually tell you if you're an emotional eater or a food addict or somewhere in between. So don't miss out on taking that quiz. Um, But I'm really excited to talk to you today about a topic that comes up a lot with my clients, Um, or I bring it up because they might not see the connection And there's a big connection between emotional eating and people pleasing. And the good news is once you get hip to this, you can't unknow it. (laughs) So you can't unknow that there's a connection and that you're probably going to have to do something about it if you want lasting weight loss. So um, make sure as you listen and watch today that you put comments in the comment section because it's really important um, to, you know, check in. Uh, we'd love to see you and comment back, um, but also just participate in your own healing journey. I think that's really, really important. So the more you engage, the more you say, yes, that's me, uh, the more likely you are to integrate this information and get benefit from it. So thank you in advance. Glad you're here. Welcome. So what's up with this topic? So the reason why this has come up for me right now is because I've been talking to some of my clients um, on our coaching calls and um, what, what my clients are finding is that eating clean isn't as easy as just, you know, choosing the right foods, eating at the right times that work for their body and for, you know, balance, like three meal magic, which is something I recommend um, and works really well for my clients. They're rocking it out, the three meal magic plan. But what they're finding is when they're out and about uh, doing the, you know, the, the summer eating, the summer uh, socializing thing, it creates complications. And you may have found this as well. You know, eating clean is easier when you're at home, when you have your schedule, when you're not, you know, bombarded by other people's needs or wants or time schedule for eating and all that, you know, when you can kind of be in a controlled environment, it's easier, right? It's easier to get what you need, have the amounts that work for you, um, the plate that you're used to, that you can kind of see the amount of food on your plate. 
um, and also fewer distractions, right? But once you jump into the social scene of picnics and barbecues and eating out and all that, that we're all starting to do, praise God, we can do that now, um, you know, in, in, in at least to some degree <laughs> um, in the climate that we're in. But, you know, when we are out and about and we're with friends, uh, there's this added element of uh, spontaneity, uh, unplanned foods, uh, unplanned uh, times or delays of our meals. Um, and that can kind of stir things up for us and make us feel a little rocky, you know, a little shaky around our clean eating plan. And so what what comes up for people that they don't realize is what they're up against is really oftentimes the issue of people pleasing because, you know, we tend to uh, not speak up for what we need around times that we want to eat or restaurants that we choose or um, foods that are going to be at a party. I mean, there's all these different factors that if we don't stand up for ourselves, if we don't sort of acknowledge what we need and express what we need, we're just sort of going to slide into this uh, wave of doing what everybody else is doing, <laughs> okay? Which is a problem because everybody else is usually eating you know, foods that might not work for us. Everybody else is usually just overeating and indulging and having a grand old time. And we will do that too if we don't recognize that there is this aspect of people pleasing to us and, and a tendency to just want to blend in, not stand out, not make waves, not disappoint anybody, yada, yada. You get where I'm going with this? You know, the, the people pleasing issue is big for emotional eaters because we're natural born people pleasers. I've rarely met an emotional eater that wasn't a people pleaser. It's the top trait of the anatomy of the emotional eater. Um, in my book, in my program, I talk about the anatomy of the emotional eater, which is 24 personality traits that really make up the emotional eaters experience that has nothing to do with food. You know, it's really important to know that emotional eating isn't just about what we eat when we eat, you know, what happens to us when we eat. No, 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 no. Being an emotional eater includes ways of being, personality traits, uh, fears, uh, sort of dysfunctional ways of relating to other people and reacting to stress and all these things that have to do with being an emotional eater that are classic signs of emotional eating and the emotional eater's personality, if those things aren't addressed, forget trying to eat clean, you know, ongoing in a sustainable way, forget losing weight and keeping it off. Just changing your diet is not enough. If you're an emotional eater, you've got to change how you live because it's not an eating problem. It's a living problem. And today's uh, talk is really about that. How do we live differently so we can eat differently? So we got to address the people pleasing because emotional eaters are people pleasers. Uh, why? Probably because at a very young age, people pleasing helped us survive. Hear me out. So early on in our lives, very typically we experienced stress and trauma. Okay. It's, you know, trauma is not a foreign experience for an emotional eater. Typically we grew up in homes where there was something funky going on. There was either sexual abuse or physical abuse or emotional abuse, um, you know, very strict control, maybe abandonment, um, uh, rage, you know, there's all kinds of things that happen to us as kids and we don't have the tools to deal with it. So what we do is we adapt in the, in the easiest way possible, because as kids, we don't have a lot of tools at our fingertips. We don't talk to adults usually about the pain we're in or the experiences we're having. We don't tell anyone at school. We don't tell our friends, you know, we keep it, you know, under wraps. We're embarrassed and ashamed about whatever's going on at home and we adapt. And one of the adaptive tools is people pleasing and it works, right? You know, if I can please mom, you know, she's going to be less stressed and then she can deal with uh, my oldest sister who is a monster. Okay. That was true. That happened as a kid. You know, I decided I'm not going to put mom through any extra stress. I'm going to be the perfect daughter. 
bad idea. <laughs> it bit me later, but that was my adaptive tool. People pleasing, trying to be a good egg, as my mother used to call me. But, you know, for other people, it's a raging parent. You know, it's a parent who is an alcoholic and has to have everything perfect at home. So you get really good at making mom or dad happy so they don't rage or so you don't get abused. Right. I mean, so people pleasing works for us. It works as a coping tool, makes per perfect sense that we've used that. Also, in addition, as emotional eaters, we don't have a strong foundation of self-esteem typically. You know, we we were raised by people who didn't have all four tires on the pavement and they were struggling with life also. And so they didn't have they didn't have a full toolkit either. And so they they couldn't give us what they didn't have, which means that, you know, typically we we were, you know, we grew up with a deficit of self-esteem, a def deficit of self-confidence. And what we have to know is people-pleasing works for us as a way of getting that validation that we didn't get as a kid or that we needed more of. And so I know for myself, I was a crazy, crazy people pleaser because I love the Atta Girls. I love to get approval. I love to have people think I was wonderful because it fed me. Okay. This is what I was hungry for. I was hungry for a sense of purpose and a sense of self and people pleasing gave that to me in a quick way. Okay. I got quick hits of validation and, and, and when I would people please, the problem is just like food, the effects are short lived. So I have to keep doing it. You know, when we eat and we get our quick fix, our numbing effect of carbs and sugar, it's great. We feel no pain but then it wears off and we got to go get some more, right? That's where the addictive eating comes in. We got to keep eating in order to keep getting that numbing effect. And so we have to keep people pleasing in order to get the validation that's very short lived. You know, those Atta girls, they fade really fast, right? And so we got to go do something else. We got to knock ourselves out going the extra mile, doing the extra project, you know, doing tasks no one else will do, saying yes to, to, you know, running committees when nobody else wants to. So just so we can be recognized and get validation. I mean, guys, we got to, we got to cop to this, right? I mean, do you relate to this? Put it in the chat, in the comment section, if you, if you relate. I mean, this was a way of life for me and it's a way of life for my clients. And, you know, it's such a way of life that we don't even know we're doing it. It's just a way of being. But if you want lasting results with weight loss, you got to start recognizing this because people pleasing has a dark underbelly and the dark underbelly is overeating. And how is that connected? Well, when we people please, you know, we are usually uh, sort of, you know, overdoing, over committing, uh, really working hard for that validation so we tend to get tired and stressed in the process of doing whatever it is we think we need to do in order to get that validation. So we tend to be, you know, we tend to exhaust our adrenals. We tend to not sleep enough. We put too much on our plate, you know, regarding our schedule, so to speak. And so, um, you know, that ends up in burnout and burnout leads to overeating. Not only that, People pleasing leads to resentment. So when we're people pleasing and saying yes to things we don't really want to say yes to, which let's be clear, nobody's making us do. We volunteer for the things we volunteer for because of the pay, pay, payout and payback we think we're going to get. So, you know, people pleasing is really a transaction for us subconsciously. Okay. We want to please other people and we're not bad people. Okay. I'm just saying that when we have this hole in our soul, this lack of a strong foundation of self-esteem, you know, we just fall into this tendency to try to get it from outside of us. And this does have to change. You know, this is so much of what Heal Your Hunger is about, is learning to come back to ourselves and find validation for ourselves, build that strong resource of self you know, self-confidence and self-satisfaction instead of going outside and trying to get it from all of you. 
So it's really important to address this. But as I was saying, people pleasing leads to resentment because nobody's ever as pleased as we want them to be, right? Like we were like, oh, you know, I did all this work, you know, what do you have to say about it? And they're like, oh, thanks. And we're like, thanks, thanks. You know, I pulled an all-nighter to finish this project or, you know, to stay up and bake those cookies for the soccer team. Like, thanks. <laughs> and so we're like, screw them. Like, I'm not getting what I thought I'd get from this. I'm going to please myself. And then we go home and we have the I deserve it binge. We all know about that, right? The I deserve it binge. We're kind of eating at other people because they didn't give, give us what we wanted. So we give it to ourselves in the form of food. It's a reward, right? a reward that turns into a punishment. If we overeat, overindulge, feel sick, hate ourselves for going overboard. So it's not always the reward we plan on it being. So that's an, that's a scenario of people pleasing back to the socializing and how it's connected to the people pleasing. So this innate tendency to please this innate tendency to try to get people to love us It creeps in when we're making plans with friends. It creeps in when we say yes to eating foods that we don't want to eat. So let me just address that. So making plans. Well, when we're trying to decide where to to eat for dinner, if we just go with like go with the flow and say wherever you guys want to eat is fine. And then they take us to a Chinese food restaurant that's just got gloppy, gloppy food you know, that doesn't taste good and has sugar in it. And we feel kind of gross and greasy afterwards. You know, we had a choice. We could have said, you know what, can we choose a different place to eat? But that takes standing for ourselves. That takes possibly disappointing somebody that takes, you know, standing out. And that's where the rub is. When we're people pleasers, we don't want to stand out. We don't want to be strange or different. We don't want to potentially ruffle feathers because we've said, you know, what we need. But in order to choose a restaurant that works for us, we're going to have to speak up for ourselves. And this is where eating clean, you know, sort of coincides with our, our natural instinct to people, please. And we've got to like really hone in on this and realize that in order to stick to a plan of eating that works for us, we're going to have to walk through the fear. Okay. And people pleasing is really just a fear of people not liking us. It's just a fear of people being disappointed or having some negative feelings uh, that are going to give us negative feelings. Cause all we're talking about is feelings here. Like we people please so often because we're afraid of disappointing but what, we, what are we afraid of? We're afraid of people uh, having feelings that give us feelings. So in my experience as a people pleaser, recovering people pleaser is that, you know, I have to get used to being uncomfortable if somebody is displeased with me. And so do you. <laughs> okay. So, you know, what's true for me is probably true for you. So I have to get used to the idea that somebody might not be happy with me. Somebody might be like, Oh, like we were, we, our plans were great until Trisha spoke up for herself and decided she wanted to go over there to that restaurant, which we have to drive to, or, you know, doesn't have as good parking or whatever. So we have to kind of risk, right? We have to risk people being unhappy with us or displeased with us, which by the way, rarely really happens. Like so much of this goes on in our heads, right? Like we're just afraid of what people will think when usually they're like, oh, Okay sure, we'll go to that restaurant instead. No biggie. But we build up all this tension because we're so afraid that we're going to piss somebody off. And then we're going to have really uncomfortable feelings. Remember, it's our feelings we're most afraid of. Yeah, we're afraid of their disapproval, their anger, potential anger. But what we're really afraid of is the feelings we're going to have if they're angry. You know, and when I was so dependent on people loving me and thinking I was wonderful and easy to get along with. It brought up a lot of anxiety for me to think that that might not be the case. Like I might rock that boat. Do you see any of this in yourself? You know, is any of this, is this, any of this resonating for you? Definitely put it in the comment section. If, if so, you know, let's have a conversation about this. This is big. This is really big. 
Okay. Because in order to really have a new relationship with food, we're going to have to walk through the fear of displease, displeasing people. Okay. So not only, you know, going to restaurants, choosing restaurants, not only will the people pleasing instinct come up then, but also if we, you know, are going to somebody's house and we need to make sure there, there are foods that work for us, which means we might need to call ahead and say, Hey, Hey, I'm so excited to come to your house. Can I ask what's going to be served? You know, cause I have some food needs and I just want to make sure I'm covered. So that's uncomfortable, right? We have to walk through some, a little bit of fear of what somebody might think of us if we do that. Um, and if there isn't food that's going to work for us, we need to ask if we can bring something, you know, a, a dish that might work for us. And would that work for the host? You know, would it be okay if I brought a salad? Would it be okay if I brought some roasted vegetables? Ooh, that's going to bring up some feelings. You know, is the host going to like me? Are they going to be mad at me? You see how we're constantly up against the people pleasing instinct when we start to take care of our needs. It's, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. That's why I'm talking to you about it today. Another thing that's going to come up is uh, the possibility of disappointing something, somebody if we don't eat the foods they've cooked for us right? So Aunt Bessie has brought her favorite peach pie that she's very invested in everybody eating and loving and giving her feedback for because she's a people pleaser too. And so Aunt Bessie, you know, uh, we don't want to displease Aunt Bessie and we don't want Aunt Bessie to pout because she will, because she's a bit childish. <laughs> so, so we're like, uh-oh, I better eat Aunt Bessie's peach pie. No. That's not true. <laughs> if you want to eat clean and you don't want to eat her pie, don't eat her pie. Let Aunt Bessie pout. Okay, let Aunt Bessie pout. And you can be nice about it. Aunt Bessie, it looks so good. I know you put so much effort into baking that gorgeous pie, um, but I'm really full. Like I'm full, I've had enough. And thank you anyway. Thank you anyway. Do you see how standing for what you need doesn't have to be so complicated or scary? We build it up in our mind like, oh my God, Aunt Bessie's going to be mad at me. Other people are going to notice me not eating. Somebody's going to try to get me to eat. Aunt Bessie's going to pout. Other, you know, Mom's going to be mad at me for making Aunt Bessie pout. And we just tell ourselves these stories in our minds when all we have to say is, thank you, Aunt Bessie. It looks amazing. I've had enough. That's it. But that is exercising, you know, our new way of being. And the new way of being is to not people please. So let Aunt Bessie have her feelings. You know, we, we get so codependent with other people because we're afraid of their feelings. Why? Because we're afraid of the feelings we're going to have when they have feelings. So just say, no, thank you, Aunt Bessie. Okay. Uh, don't be afraid to disappoint people by saying no to foods that they've made. You know, you can do it easily. Um, it, you know, when you do it in a kind way, it's not that hard, but you will have feelings initially and then you'll get used to it. It'll be so much easier, um, you know, but we don't owe people eating foods that don't feel good to us or, or make us feel good about ourselves. I mean, sure, peach pie is great in the moment, but if it's going to make you feel bad about yourself later, bad about your choices or trigger a need to eat more pie or some ice cream on top of it and then some cookies after that, <laughs> you know, and you want to say no to the pie, do it. Stand for yourself for once. It's not something we're used to doing as emotional eaters. Stand for yourself. Okay. You first, you first for once. My mentor used to say, if Jesus was coming over for dinner, you know, I'd, I'd still say no. If, if, if he were cooking, <laughs> he was making something that didn't work for me. I'd say, no, thank you, Jesus. You know, I wouldn't eat it to people, please Jesus. And Jesus would probably understand, <laughs> but that just kind of drives home the point that we don't owe anybody eating something that doesn't feel good to us or make us feel good about ourselves. You picking up where, what I'm laying down here, please. I'd love some amens in the comment section. That'd be great. The other thing is breaking tradition. You know, we're afraid to break tradition by not being, you know, the matriarch, the, 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 um, the baker extraordinaire. You know, if you've been used to baking as a way of, 
uh, you know, love, showing love to your family, to your grandkids. And you're all of a sudden thinking, you know, baking doesn't really work for me because I end up eating half of what I bake or tasting all the way through my baking, you know, hours. And you want to do something different, but you're afraid of what the family's going to say. Like, oh, mom, we're so used to your cookies or, oh, you know, they, they kind of lay it on thick of how they want you to make the traditional whatever for Thanksgiving or, or holiday, other holidays. And it hooks our, our, our love of being loved, right? Our love of positive reinforcement and uh, at a girls, we're up against the people pleasing again. You know, do I want to do what works for my body, which makes me feel better about my food choices? Or do I want to get those, those cheap (laughs) attagirls? I mean, hard won by lots of baking, of course, but you see how we're up against the people pleasing again. Like I want the validation, but I don't want to feel bad about my food choices. And I'm just starting to feel good. I'm starting to lose weight, look better, feel better. You know, numbers are going down on my sugars. Um, you know, cholesterol and all that. So what are we going to do? And I promise you the benefits of feeling good about ourselves and our food choices far outweighs the out girls, far outweighs the out girls. You know, we need to change our way of being, which is no longer just working for those, you know, those cheap thrills of validation. So breaking traditions hard because We might disappoint some people. We might, you know, get some, ah, mom, we miss this, that, and the other. We miss those, you know, cheesy potatoes or whatever, or we miss those buns that you bake, Um, you know, make a decision. What's, what's it worth to you to feel good in your skin, to feel good about your food choices? You're going to have to give some things up. And part of that is, you know, pleasing everybody. But I promise you, I have had clients who do break tradition and they create a whole new tradition, one that's not so food focused. And you can do this too. You know, your holidays can have new traditions. Why not stay young, stay youthful. Don't stay, you know, just rigid and tied to the way things have always been. You know, if you do what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always gotten. And chances are you're not too happy with what you've always gotten in terms of your relationship with food. So break out, try a new tradition, create a new tradition, let people whine a bit. Those are just going to create feelings for them and for you move through the feelings and experience the joy of something new. And all of a sudden people are like, oh, this is really cool. I didn't know this would be so fun. You know, play games, pick some new games, do, do something crazy, go for, you know, a walk, do, do some tradition that has nothing to do with food. And people will adjust. So are you seeing how, you know, changing your relationship with food does take changing, you know, your relationships, period? And with yourself, a relationship with yourself, because you're going to have to, you're going to have to reach deeper and do some things that may be uncomfortable, but will pay off big time in the end. The other thing I want to bring up around people pleasing and eating is the, the yearning to be normal. Oh, that delusion of normalcy, (laughs) you know, we've spent a lifetime wishing we could be normal, right? If only I could be like everybody else, if only I could be like Susie who can eat one cookie and be satisfied. Like what's that? And so we always want to be like Susie, but we're not, you know, we eat one cookie and we want to eat more cookies. Uh, You know, we want to finish the bag. And so why can't we be normal? Why can't we be more normal? We look at other people as if, you know, they're from another planet or as we're, we're from another planet, it was more like it, you know, and we long to be normal. And I just want to say that what is normal for one thing, But, you know, it really is an illusion and it's a drive that can get us into a lot of trouble trying to be normal because we will try and try again and we will really bloody ourselves, beat ourselves up trying in this quest to be normal. Whereas if we just accept, hey, you know, one cookie, that's that's a joke. That doesn't work for me. So I always say none is better than some. So it's just saying no, thank you you know, that's the kinder, gentler thing, you know, and if you think, I don't want to be feel deprived, what are you depriving yourself of a binge later feeling bloated, you know, 
having, having inflammation in your body. Sure. Go ahead and deprive yourself of that. You'll feel so much better. Just have to reframe it. Okay. But just know that, you know, it, this quest to be normal can get us into trouble, you know, accepting that you're an emotional eater, accepting that some foods don't work for you, or you can't eat certain foods without getting triggered. Even though Susie doesn't have that experience, you know, it's okay to accept that you have that experience and to follow, to, to follow what's next from that acceptance. You know, I've accepted that one cookie, one piece of cake, you know, one bowl of ice cream just doesn't do it for me. <laughs> and it's easier for me to say, no, thank you. than to try to manage something that usually becomes unmanageable very quickly. So I don't try to be normal, but you know what? The paradox is when I accept that I'm not normal, that I'm an emotional eater and I have to, you know, make choices that work for me that may not be the same choices other people make. When I accept that, very interestingly, I start to look normal. So when people eat, you know, with me at dinner or, you know, I meet somebody at a restaurant and I order, nobody really knows these truths about me necessarily, unless they, you know, I'm close to them, but I look like a normal eater. So by accepting that I'm really not normal, I've become so much more normal. Like it's, I'm just more relaxed around food and my food choices are mine. You know, they, they correspond with what my needs are, but I don't make a big deal about them. And I end up just looking like a normal eater. So it's just kind of a strange paradox that accepting that you're not normal can actually make you seem more normal. And lastly, just, you know, don't be so afraid about what people think of you when you speak up for your food needs or when you're at a restaurant and you ask about certain ingredients, you know, does that sauce have sugar in it? So much of the time we're so afraid to stand out. We're so afraid of what people will think of us. If we ask for, you know, certain things that we need, we so don't want to rock the boat. We want to go along with what everybody else is doing, but how has that really worked for you? So I want to encourage you to just throw off that concern about what people think of you when you take care of your needs. First of all, it's more than ever, it's normal. You know, at restaurants, people are used to people being gluten-free or sugar-free or alcohol-free or whatever. It's just like, it's the server's job to cater to what you need. I mean, that's, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. So don't be afraid to speak up now more than ever. Food allergies, food at sensitivities, it's just a way of the world. You know, we're more hip to the idea that it is a thing. You know, it is a thing. Our guts are sensitive. Our bodies are sensitive and not everybody can eat the same thing. So don't be afraid to speak up. Don't be worrying about what people are going to think of you. Mark Twain said, you wouldn't be nearly as concerned what, about what people think of you if you realized how seldom they do. <laughs> so your head's super busy thinking about what they're thinking when they might just be thinking, what am I going to order? Or, oh, her order sounds good. Maybe I'll have that. So just try to let it go. Like try to, this obsession with, with what people think, oh, it's so old, isn't it? It's just so old. We don't need to live that way anymore. You're, you're free. Like you're free to be you. You do you. You do you. You are amazing and beautiful. You're a child of God. You're God's favorite baby daughter or son. You know? Do you, that's the best way to be. And everybody else will adjust if it matters at all, but usually it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, our, our heads are very noisy as people pleasers thinking about what people think of us. And they really aren't thinking about us. They really don't care. They don't care what you eat. They don't care what you order. They don't care. You know, they care about you, you know, as friends, but you know, the noise in your head thinking what they're thinking. You don't need that anymore. Let it go. Just let it go. Do what you need to do for you so you can feel good. Don't you want to feel good at the end of the meal? Don't you want to feel good at the end of the party? Don't you want to feel good when you go home and wake up the next day? Don't you want to feel good about the choices you made? Yeah. Oh, that tastes so much better than any dessert. I promise you waking up in the morning, feeling good about the choices you made the day before pure deliciousness and you deserve that. So I hope this information is helpful. I really wanted to drive home the fact that, you know, eating clean 
and making choices you feel good about will run you up against certain feelings inside, certain tendencies to want to please, you know? And so I want you to be aware of that because when you fall down or, or if you had fallen down prior to listen to this, you'll know why you'll know that the people pleasing thing might've kicked in, might've kicked your butt, but it doesn't have to anymore. So consider yourself informed and transformed by this information. Love to hear your thoughts in the comment section. Uh, yeah. And, and just enjoy your summer, enjoy your friends. It's all about the love. It's not about the food. It's about the love. Please share this show. If you enjoyed it, I love you so much and I'll see you on the next one. Bye. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to get free support, insider health info, exclusive invites to events, and more, visit HealYourHunger.com.